Hello, and welcome to the Green Voice podcast. I'm your host, Grant Irvin, with SNB USA, coming to you f- from the Center for Media Innovation at Point Park University. Uh, and I have my great guest with me here today, Michael Volpat from Volpat Construction. Uh, looking to get into a great conversation with Michael. Uh, and uh, Michael, how are you doing today? Good, Grant. Thanks for having me. It's uh, awesome that you're here. And we've been trying to pull you on to the Green Voice podcast here for some time. So I feel like success is here for us. Well, so. we've it's actually good timing because a lot has gone on since we first met. So it I'm is. looking forward to getting caught up. It is true. And, um, I have all kinds of questions for you, but we've met just a little over two years ago now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when you were plotting your escape from California, exactly. I think was, uh, there's like an escape pod that you, I have this vision. You were like, Psh. I was actually telling Rhonda the story today. You know, my, I came back to Pittsburgh to work for the family business because my brother, uh, I got a phone call one morning at 6 a.m., get on a plane, get home, your brother's in surgery. And I told Rhonda as I was landing, I kind of knew. Okay. Like, it's time. It's time to come home. It's time to come home. So that was that was in, uh, August of 2022. August of 22. Okay. Yeah. And I bought my place here in Pittsburgh in that December. Uh-huh. Or, sorry, that October. Yeah. Um, so it was a pretty fast transition. Uh, it's, it goes quick. Once, once you feel like the home embers burning, I think in Pittsburgh, it happens quickly. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to talk ab- about a couple things right off the bat. You know, one, um, I want to learn and share with the audience more about Volpac Construction, but I'd really like to start with you first because um, you have such an interesting story personally, um, and a little bit maybe about like that that boomeranging and 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 what brought you back, but also what what took you out to California. And so, what's the Michael Volpat story? Um, uh, so, I grew up in Pittsburgh, right? Right. And um, I went to the University of Pittsburgh. I actually went away to D.C. for one year, but came back to go to Pitt. Okay. Um, Hail Pitt. Hail Pitt. Yep. Yep. And I studied, I had a double major in um, business and anthropology. Um, And I um, went to Canton, Ohio after college to work for Bob Evans Farms. Really? That's uh, yeah. Okay. And so I worked for them at um, one of their restaurants, Cantina del Rio. It was this new restaurant concept that they came up with. Okay. Um, but within a few months, and they started it in Canton. Is Bob Evans based there, or what's that? N- no, there was one of their restaurants. One okay. of those restaurants was in Canton. Okay. Bob Evans is based in Columbus. Okay. And I wound up working for the corporate office. I was a billboard buyer. Oh, interesting. Um, and I worked at. Bob Evans for years, and then the internet was happening, and I okay. wanted to be a part of that. So I joined an interactive agency in in Columbus, Ohio. Okay, um, and that got me thinking a lot about technology and innovation, and um, I wanted to be on that track. And yeah, so then I ended up moving to New York City and okay. worked for a startup that didn't start up. It was called SpaCafe.com. Okay. <laughs> One of the many dot coms? Or... Well, yeah. And then <laughs> then I got pulled over to work for a company called Electron Economy, another startup that didn't start up. Also in New York? No, that was in San Jose, okay. in Cupertino, California. So okay. I moved out to San Francisco. Okay. And I lived in San Francisco for a while. That startup didn't start up. I ended up Starting to work for a um, a PR firm, um, and then they catapulted me back to New York. Okay, and I lived in New York for about five years, and that's where I started my company, mm-hmm. which was called Larkin Volpat Communications. Me right. and my business partner Kate Larkin, we focused on early stage technology companies, mm. and lived in New York for a while, and then decided I needed to be in Silicon Valley. She would stay in New York. Okay. So I moved out to San Francisco and started- Back again. Yeah, back again. I'm visualizing like these airplanes going back and forth across the United Uh, States. I've done that uh, transatlantic flight a million times. Um, And then I ended up buying a place in Sonoma County. Okay. And I was in Sonoma County in the Russian River for 13 years. Wow. Um, and in those 13 years, uh, in the, the last four that I was there, I was evacuated four times, uh, because once, three times because of fire and once because of flood. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So coming home while I knew I was coming home for my family, I, there were environmental 
reasons why I was coming back as well. What What is that like as a, as a resident, though? I mean, because California, as, as we're taping this right now, is going through a, a deluge of precipitation. I don't even know if that's under underscoring it enough, but um, <clears throat> what's it like going through that? So the first time it happens, it's a little overwhelming because, mm-hmm. you know, I was sitting at a dinner with friends. Okay. And we look at our phones. You have an hour. The wind has changed. You have an hour. Get out. Get out. Go home, take everything that's important to you, yeah. put it in your car, right? Mm-hmm. And so I did that. And I decided that I was going to go to my friend's house in Bolinas, California, which is right near Stinson Beach. So okay. it's off of the Highway 1. Okay. And when I got onto Highway 1 and looked at my rearview mirror, I could see flames. Oh, so my goodness. that was overwhelming. Yeah. Um, and when <clears throat> I got to Bolinas, I, my friend and I went out to a bar and... The bartender looked at me and she said, I haven't seen you here before. She said, you must be one of the evacuees. And I just, I lost it. Like it, wow. it hit me. It, like right? emotionally. Yeah. And then the next three times I was fine. <laughs> <laughs> like I have my go bag. I know what I need to take. I'm out of here. So it's like your your skin thickens with each incident? Yeah, it thickens within each incident. But, you know, I sold my place in California. And then right after that, I think both State Farm and Allstate possibly yeah. both mentioned that or decided that they aren't going to insure homes in the Mm -hmm. state of California or in those fire zones at the very least. Which is significant. Yeah. Now, how much of that, you know, it's interesting to kind of break this down a little bit. We know each other from kind of work in technology and, and, you know, conversations we've had about, you know, the environment and how it applies to construction, which we'll we'll get into. But um, how much do those... Uh, those incidents that you are a part of in California influence kind of your mindset and your work right now? Like, is it, is, were you thinking of the environment before then uh, th- those events or have they strengthened or, you know, or, or is it a result of, or a little bit of both? I, I, I come at it from a couple, from a couple angles, right? I, I you know, I've always been very interested in technology mm-hmm. and, and the way technology affects our day-to-day lives, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I also lived in California for yeah. many years. And so the whole concept or notion of con- uh, of composting and recycling, yeah. that's kind of like burned into your brain. It's a, it's an ethos. Yeah. It's, like, and you've like, it's what the Joneses do, right? right? Yeah. You know, I, I actually owned a little restaurant in Sonoma County, and we used to we used to save as much as we possibly could uh-huh. in terms of food waste, yeah. um, whether it was composting it or making sure that, you know, it's like material reuse and construction, mm-hmm. like like uh, food reuse. Sure. Um, you know, anything that we could do to maximize a carrot, right? That's yep. a, a good example. We yeah. would do that, right? So throw away as little as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and then thinking about how technology applies applies to all of that, I think is a really important. So when I came back to Volpac Construction, my brother asked me to define what I wanted my role to be. <laughs> and because I have such a strong marketing background, I was mm-hmm. of course going to be managing our marketing, our business development. Sure. Um, but the other piece that I wanted was an innovation piece. Mm-hmm. Um, as a marketing person, differentiation is very important to mm-hmm. me, right? And being stewards of the environment um, in an industry that is known for for not being that for not being that right um, it 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 was an opportunity mm-hmm. we can do good we can differentiate our business right yep and we can we can position ourselves as stewards of the environment that's amazing. So that in being in California, like that that cauldron of technology, what were some of the things that you were coming across, both from like the client side, but also like in terms of that innovation ecosystem? So when it really hit me that there was an opportunity for innovation and construction was in 2017. I I met a man named John Burton and a woman named Angie Sticker. Angie came from Apple. Okay. Um, She was a product engineer at Apple. And John came from a company that uh, was purchased by a Japanese. I don't know, it was a manufacturing technology mm-hmm. company, right? So they had a very strong technology background. Angie Software, John Hardware. Okay. Um, 
and they started a company called Ursuleo. Mm. And uh, we started doing public relations work for them. Okay. As Larkin Volpat. As Larkin Volpat. Um, and they pivoted a few times. And the, the last pivot and where we are now, where mm-hmm. they are now with the company, and, and I can say we, because in the interest of full disclosure, yeah. Volpat Construction is an investor and I'm mm-hmm. on the board of this company now. Um, so they pivoted to the development of what's called a digital twin. Mm-hmm. Everyone has a different definition. Um, we define a digital twin as taking a Revit file, mm-hmm. whether it's of a piece of machinery or and a for building. Folks in the audience, what's a Revit file? Yeah. yeah. So a Revit file is an architectural file. Okay. It's a program that's used to design something mm. in 3D. Okay. Right. So they take these Revit files, they make these digital twins, and these digital twins um, can visualize IoT data. Right, so Internet, Internet of, of Things, things. Yep. exactly. Okay, um, so you have a building that has all these sensors and devices, and you're getting all this information. What do you do with it here? These guys can effectively visualize it. Yeah. yeah. So right now, I mean, if you have a new refrigerator, right, there is likely an IoT sensing mm-hmm. device in that refrigerator. It's a smart refrigerator. It's a smart refrigerator, right. and if it is a smart refrigerator, then data is being collected, whether mm-hmm. it's going somewhere. You don't know. But it's there. But it's there. Yeah. And if you can send it that data to the cloud, you can visualize it in this digital twin, mm. right? Um, it became clear to me quickly that the digital twin technology had relevance in the construction industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I talked to John and Angie and I said, this should be one of the markets that yeah. we focus on and my brother should be part of the advisory board. Yeah. Yeah. Tell you know we're gonna go down a rabbit hole. I feel it, but before we do that, tell me about Volpat Construction. Um, you know, it's it's a name that we we see in in and around Pittsburgh in a number of different sectors. But maybe introduce the company and 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 how that you know that connection from here in Pittsburgh and the connection with your brother Ray, and then kind of bringing some of this this West Coast software technology back to the Berg. What that looks like. But tell me Volpat Construction. So Volpac Construction was started by my dad. Okay. Um, my dad worked for Dick Corporation out of college. Okay. Uh, then um, the kind Noble of a Dick... venerable Pit- Pittsburgh name. Yeah. 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 And then uh, he went on to be the founding president of PJ Dick Corporation. Um, and when Perry Dick passed away, my father, uh, the son-in-laws, wanted to take over mm-hmm. and kind of do things their own way, which was great. Sure. Um, because my father then moved on and started Volpat Construction. Awesome. Uh, my brother started working for Volpat. God, I for I don't I don't, I forget when, but he's now the president. Okay. Um, and we don't use dates here. That's right. That's I know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we don't need that. Um, <laughs> but we we do commercial work, uh, uh-huh. mostly in higher education, healthcare, and we have um, deep industry knowledge in restoration and preservation of mm. historic spaces right now we're we're working on five church projects wow um advising on a few others um and then also which is a serious niche here in pittsburgh yeah in it is a yeah. niche we've actually started a service where we do assessments of historic spaces mm-hmm. we from the ground up uh, you know um here's what you need we identify what's needed we prioritize what should be done create a budget against it and give them a report what that does for a historic space um Mm. like the immaculate heart of mary church we're working on now they're applying for a grant and it makes that that organization more fundable yeah um we got some real numbers to work with exactly yeah so you know we know exactly what we need and we've done all the assessment Mm -hmm. um now give us the money that we yeah (laughs) that we want so it's kind of like a pre-estimation services I would call it a facilities assessment okay. service. Okay. Right. Um, so we're do we're in the in the throes of this with Immaculate Heart of Mary. We're working on a letter of intent for what's called the Fund for Sacred Places. Mm. Um, we're going to ask for a large sum of money, and then we have to put together a campaign to match to those funds. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Which is always like if you know what you're working towards, particularly for a place like that. I don't want to say that it's easy, but it it gives you a north star to work for. Yeah, and then you know you might think to yourself, well, where does 
innovation come into play for a historic site like that. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, this church was built in 1897, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, There are probably no 3D digital files of the architectural plans. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So there's a company here in Pittsburgh called Cadnetics. Cadnetics were recommending to the church, um, which the Immaculate Heart of Mary is one of the shrines, five shrines of Pittsburgh. That, really? Yep. The diocese has set aside five different churches. Interesting. I can't name them all, so don't ask me. That's uh, all right. Um, there won't be a test. But uh, um, but two of them, St. Stanislaus in, uh, the strip. in the Strip and then St. Anthony, the Relics Church up in Troy Hill. Oh, wow. And okay. for anyone listening, if you don't know about this church, it's the largest number of relics outside of the Vatican. St. Anthony's. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Up in Troy Hill. It's really good. Go to Scratch and Go Co. to Scratch. <laughs> yeah. Go to Scratch and Co. And then walk over. Right. We're always trying to find a way to do like name drop sponsorships here on the Green Exactly. Boys, so. Thank you, Scratch and Co. Yeah. Scratch and Co. If you're listening. Yeah. So. Grant and I will be coming in for our, <laughs> our free cocktail. We'll be, we'll be doing an assessment. Yes. Um, so... So back to churches, mm-hmm. right, and why that matters. Cadnetics uh, does LIDAR scanning. Mm, and Exterior. The whole thing. Okay. So what we are recommending to the church, because they don't have 3D architectural files, that, so we, you know, building a digital twin would be challenging. Uh, they'll come in. They'll do a LIDAR scan of that building. Uh, and it's down to they they visualize all of the beauty of that church mm. in the interior which is fascinating that they can do that with lidar wow. um and then we take that and turn it into a digital twin and it can be used in a number of ways right so we can we can visualize any data that's coming out of that if they want to mm-hmm. um focus on humidity they want to focus on the temperature inside of the building um they want to look at energy usage over time all of these things can be visualized and that data can be collected. And it's almost, and I've seen some of this too, but maybe to like to, to explain and visualize it for a listening audience. Like you're basically creating like a video game almost of this historic structure in this case, right? Yeah. I mean, it's built on the NVIDIA um, platform. So, and it's the NVIDIA Omniverse platform. Wow. Um, and GDN, which I don't know, I, I think that's the game development. I'm not sure. So okay. I'm going to stop. That's what John's for. Yeah, John that's Burton. what John's yeah. for. Yeah. So um, it's developed on that platform. The visualizations are absolutely beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, you can walk through the building. You know, wow. it's 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 fantastic. And why I think that's important Um during construction or during design, mm-hmm. the architect really understands how to use Revit. Mm-hmm. Contractors and project managers in the construction side, they're not Revit people. Yeah. So extracting the Revit file, making it a digital twin, allows for collaboration mm-hmm. for the architect, the contractor, and the owner of, and, the, of the building. And so that gets in that gets into some of like the ability to visualize, but also then put it into construction drawings that are workable from the builder standpoint. You're actually seeing it on your desktop. Wow! Right. So if you're in a collaboration session, mm-hmm. you may be in, you know, Timbuktu, and I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we're actually looking at the twin and talking through. The design, much making, like you're in the space, much like you're in the space, you're making notes. You know, let's say that during construction, mm-hmm. um, the superintendent has an issue with where the HVAC unit's going. Okay. So instead of the mechanical people coming down to the site, you get on a collaboration session, and you can, you know, point out. So there's there's time savings there, mm-hmm. right? Travel savings, all yep. those, all those kinds of you things. You can be in four corners of the country, but right. working on a building in Pittsburgh, effectively. Right. And so, and then you think about, okay, well, what's the life cycle of this technology for mm-hmm. from a building perspective? So you use it all throughout construction. And one mm-hmm. of the things that we learned during our research on the pla- what we wanted the platform to do was our project managers at Volpe Construction were telling us one of the most challenging things they have at the end of a project is the handover. Mm. So you hand the owner? you hand the building over to the owner and the handoff mm-hmm. usually includes a bunch of operations manuals, all of the Here's submittals. Here's how your building works. All of the information yep. that goes into what that what's mm. inside of that building. 
and what how the facilities manager is going to manage that building. So the second thing we did once we kind of learned that was we started building database functionality mm -hmm. inside of the twin yep. that maps to, let's say, let's bring up the air handling unit again. The facilities manager, you know, something's wrong yep. with the air handling unit. During construction, the project manager has uploaded all the information that there is to be known about that air handling that's the unit. That's interesting. He can click on it, and down comes the PDF. That's an operations manual. So, so then the the you know when in that handoff, you have the the designers collaborate with the builders. The builders then can hand off that final product to the operators, the facilities engineers, whomever. Um, the owners of the property, and they now they have a full working record digitized of that facility. Right. And so when you put that in context of the church, mm -hmm. that you didn't have a digital replica of that mm -hmm. church before, now you do. Right. Um, and what's really cool, I think, for the shrines of Pittsburgh, for example, people come from all over the world to see those shrines. Mm hmm Imagine if they can visit those shrines online, walk through that digital twin, virtually. and see it virtually. Wow. Right? What is, uh, from some of those functional uses, and we've talked about this in the past, when the owner has it and has that digital twin information, what are some of the implications for, for operations, like the energy use, and um, how does that, you know, we were just talking about the refrigerator. Now your building has intelligence. Like, what, what do you do with a smart building effectively then? Well, there's a few things. First of all, it has great implications for artificial intelligence. Mm. So if you look at a ton of buildings across the board, right, mm -hmm. and you've collected all of this interesting information, you're informing artificial intelligence, and you can start doing um, decision-making, mm -hmm. right, um, and there's a word I'm looking for, and I can't think of it. But you know, it, if you know that this one thing happens, we'll t we'll you we'll continue to use the HVAC unit. Yeah. We know that this one thing happens to this HVAC unit over and over again, and it happens every three months. Mm. Predictive maintenance. Yeah. So you now you can fine tune the the operation. Right. You can fine tune the operation. You know that this one wheel thing is going to go out, yeah. or a fan's going to go out. So you can be a little more prepared. Whoa. and ready to understand what's happening. And then you've got the database. So mm -hmm. now let's say that this HVAC unit is used across hundreds of buildings mm -hmm. and you've had all these contractors that have uploaded these PDFs. Now you don't really maybe have to upload that PDF. All the project manager has to do is type in the serial number and mm -hmm. boom, it's now in that database. And so that record gives you the ability to you know, prevent a, she a machine from operating, increase the, the life, uh, the usable life of equipment, in enhance the efficiency, reduce energy consumption. Yeah, there's there's a lot <clears throat> of there's a lot of opportunities there. And we can integrate with with many technologies. We're already uh, an integration partner with Procore, mm -hmm. which is widely used across the construction industry. Right. Um, there's a there's an energy monitoring software called Sk SkySpark, which I think you mm -hmm. and I have talked about that yeah. before. So that can analyze energy data coming out of a building, and you can set thresholds. You know, if something gets to this temperature, you know, it's time to send a send a notification yeah. and turn that down there's just a number of different things that can be done it's amazing so we're really talking about you know the visualization component what are some other technologies that you you have kind of in your 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 quiver of arrows of technology that you're looking at so we are thinking a lot about um embodied carbon mm -hmm. and i have to thank my position on the on the um through the MBA on the Green Committee, because that they've just kind of, I, I've been informed of of embodied carbon through them, um, and basically in the UK, an embodied carbon for folks listening is basically the the carbon dioxide intensity of manufactured materials, right? So like, what's it take to uh, how, you know, the amount of carbon it takes to produce steel or concrete or items like that. Right? Yeah. So then add in the gas that it takes to get to the construction site, uh -huh. the, you know, building it, right? And what that potentially gives off over the life cycle of a building. I mean, there are many different things that go into calculating embodied carbon. 
I wish I could sit here and explain <laughs> it. I can't. It's amazing. I, we just actually started to do some analysis uh, of uh, scope one, scope two, and scope three carbon emissions. So like for the, the layman out there, you know, the scope one emissions is effectively, you know, stuff that you burn, like your fuel consumption. Mm -hmm. Scope two is the uh, your electricity or utility uh, consumption. And then scope three is everything else. And that's where embodied carbon falls into. And it's amazing the volumes that you see with with products like like concrete and steel in terms of the impact it has on construction companies, but also then ultimately kind of owners and like what goes into it. And so this is I mean, this is you're on to something here. Yeah. Well, what was what I learned um, through my position on the subcommittee at the MBA or the committee at the MBA is that, um, you know, in the in places like the UK, for example, mm -hmm. It's you're required to to um, report embodied carbon on construction projects, mm. and there are two databases. One is called ICE, the other one is called EC3. Mm -hmm. um, do me a favor and log on to the EC3 database okay. and try to figure out the embodied carbon <laughs> of like not a ton easy. of bricks. Yeah. It's not easy. Yeah. And so I was doing research and I, f I discovered this company called Qflow. Okay. That's out of the UK. Um, what they do is you put an app on your phone, mm -hmm. you take a picture of a bill of lading or the superintendent takes a picture when it arrives on the job site. Okay. Uploads into the Qflow so technology. It's, so it's like an inventory tool. Exactly. Okay. And it calculates... <clears throat> The amount of embodied carbon. Wow. Okay. So it, I don't know how it works or how it does, but the platform is pretty fascinating. Okay. Um, and we've tested it out. It's it's really unique. So you would effectively have, let me kind of play that back. You would have a project manager or somebody on the team, like as product and materials delivered to a construction site, they would take a picture of it, inventory it, upload it into Qflow. And Qflow would automatically start to calculate that embodied carbon of those materials going into the project. Yep. Boom. It's exactly what it is. Wow. And it's really fascinating. Now, right now in the United States, it's a nice to have. Uh -huh. It's not a have to have. Right. You know. But if you think about if we have to start reporting embodied carbon, With right? New SEC rulings potentially coming. Yeah. And, yeah. So if we have to report embodied carbon and you didn't have Qflow, You'd have to have a whole group of people in your company, mm -hmm. and that that's all they would be doing is calculating embodied carbon on projects. Right. So for Volpac Construction, we're a mid-sized construction firm. Mm -hmm. You know, it would it would challenge us. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine what it would do to a Mascaro or a PJ Dick or a Mercedes, right? Like right. they're bigger, yeah. and the, it really getting people, skilled people that understand how to use that database would be challenging. That's why Qflow is so fascinating hmm. to me. That's it's so it's so unique too. And it it starts to look at like the uh, you know, that issues of innovation, right? Like you see these challenges, whether it's carbon or um, you know, building design technologies. And what I like about the two examples that you provide is it it's taking simple tools you know, whether that's, you know, game engines and that they're hardly simple, but things that are in existing activities, your phone and, you know, all that and just putting it into the building industry. Yeah. And then we've had this conversation before, but I think it's great to talk about is that now that you've. So Ursa Leo can integrate with Qflow, right? Mm. And it can pull all of that embodied carbon data into that database that I was talking Into about. Into the digital right? twin. So we'll go back to the HVAC unit again, yeah. right? Um, or think about all the materials that went into building, all the concrete, all of the uh, steel framing, mm -hmm. anything, any material that goes in that building. You now have an inventory of everything. So when that, when you go to renovate yep. or um, decommission, the architect has a an inventory of everything in there and they can think very strategically about material reuse. Wow. I'm think I'm visualizing and I'm aging myself but visualizing people trans transitioning from CDs to digital files of music and you're you're basically starting to uh, to digitize all of that data now and you make it into a more usable format that's then shareable and accessible um, that just 
accelerates the speed of innovation then. Like yeah. What you can do with it. I mean, it, this, I think, <clears throat> um, a lot of this has has the ability to to seriously revolutionize an industry that that it's my industry, so I feel like I can say this yeah, is yeah. not very revolutionary. I mean, you know, concrete and steel are centuries, eons old types of materials, right? Mm -hmm. um, that have been used, and so how do you? I mean, this goes into like the material side. Think about that. You now have manufacturing companies that are finding ways to decarbonize concrete to decarbonize steel production. Um, you have owners that are talking about that, like how can I get uh, you know, green steel or greener concrete into you know, my projects and those sorts of things, and this enables it, right? Yeah, I mean, and you have an organization like the Green Voice that is- <laughs> Telling people all about it. Going, telling people <laughs> all about it, but then also we're working with them on doing a series called uh, uh, build for the future, Rhonda. Correct me if I'm wrong. This on is that. A, this is a big release. Yeah. This yeah. is a big now, release. Now I'm now I'm forgetting I'm forgetting the name. But we're doing a series of four different panels. Well, um, hold on, before you go okay. there, I want I want you to talk a little bit about. I want to lead into that for a second. Great, you've been really good about that in in kind of your boomerang of Pittsburgh and in terms of stoking these conversations, right? Um, both as as you know, Volpac Construction, you know, sponsoring and and you bringing these ideas to the table. Um, why is it so important in your mind to talk about those sorts of things? Uh, it, it's almost like the elephant in the room, right? Mm. Um, because we have a whole new generation of people coming into this industry. Mm -hmm. Into construction, into sustainability. Yeah, and yeah. if you know the construction industry in Pittsburgh, which I think you do, yep. you know that we all know each other it's, it's a lot of our fathers started these companies, mm -hmm. right? Lots of family-owned companies. A lots of family-owned companies, and so you have this new generation of of owners mm -hmm. uh, of these companies that understand the importance of thinking differently. Yep. And so, you know, it like start start not starting the conversation, but continuing the conversation and turning up the volume mm -hmm. is really important because. I don't want to hold anything to my chest. Yeah, get it. We're off. only going to be successful as an industry if we all work together on finding solutions. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that like the the con tech or construction technology space is such a, a burgeoning uh, a burgeoning landscape, and it is so here in Pittsburgh. I mean, you know, when you start to look at things that are happening, whether it's a you know a company like Ursa Leo or QFlow or um, you know, some of the other technology, building off of other technology industries like robotics um, or electrification, like these things are all crossing over into construction right now, energy. Um, and it's an exciting time to be there. And, and, you know, that, given that, like you're looking to host kind of four conversations here with Pittsburgh Earth Day coming up. What, uh, tell me a little bit about kind of that format and then also, you know, what the, uh, the idea is in terms of, hosting those conversations and, and some of the topics that you guys are looking to cover. And it's fair. You're getting some 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 cheat sheet notes passed in class here. Yeah, so I know. It's... I love it. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, <laughs> so it's called Building for a Greener Future, right? Um, and we're doing it in conjunction with the Green Voice. Um, awesome. Rhonda and Anthony have been awesome throughout this whole process. Um, so it's, it's a series of four different panels. Mm -hmm. We host them at the Duquesne Club, um, S&B. Yep. is part of that. Grant is our moderator on these panels. And the first one we're doing uh, is called Before the Shovel Hits the Dirt. Okay. Uh, and this is an important conversation mm -hmm. um, because the whole concept of that panel is you really have to start thinking about sustainability on a mm -hmm. project before the shovel hits the dirt. Yep. So it has to be during the planning phase. Mm -hmm. You can't you know, be past schematic design yep. and deciding who the contractor is going to be on the project and then fit that's right that in, right? So we're doing the renovation of the Robotics Institute at the University of Pittsburgh in Newell Simon Hall. Okay. And part of our response to their RFP was let's think about this before we do it, mm -hmm. right? Let's take an inventory of everything in that building. Let's partner with Construction Junction. Let's partner with Michael Brothers. Mm. And let's come up with a plan. As you take stuff out. As we take stuff out. Yeah. So we're not demoing it and then deciding what to do with it. 
So phase one of this was just thinking about it mm-hmm. and deciding, you know, as a group, how we were going to manage it. So phase two has been inventorying everything that Construction Junction will take. Mm-hmm. We're going to meet with Michael Brothers and talk to them about other materials within that building that we can recycle. Mm. So that's really exciting to us. And actually, we, we, we did this most recently on a project with the Carnegie Museum. So Carnegie Museum um, had an exhibit that, that we were rebuild, rebuilding a new exhibit for them, and we had to demo the old exhibit. The, the materials of that exhibit were beautiful. Furniture grade wood, like mm. just amazing. Yeah, It would have gone to the trash. Right? Really? Yep. So we gave Carl Zellers over at Construction Junction a call. He came and looked at it and said, yep, I can take that away. So 95% of that demo went to Construction Junction. So somebody's going to have this this exhibit in their house somewhere in Pittsburgh. Somebody's going to use that wood in some way, <laughs> shape, or form. Yeah. It's 2,849 pounds that we diverted from the landfill. Wow. That's so, something to celebrate. Yeah. Well, to talk, you know, before the shovel hits the dirt, I mean, that's so important in the construction industry. Like, I've learned that in the in the civil construction world. Um, you know, we're thinking about large infrastructure and how important that is to have those conversations with owners and designers up front and early as builders, right? Mm-hmm. Because you can either encourage, you know, efficiencies in the project or like you're talking about, you know, material selection. Um, is it buildable? <laughs> I've heard that sometimes stuff is difficult to construct yeah. um, and are different from like a design standpoint. Um I mean that that's something that's so important even from a procurement standpoint, right? Like what how are you constructing contracts and things of that nature? Um I was going to say too like the wayside is that another event that we're looking at in terms of uh the four part series. When you say the wayside, when we're thinking about uh how we're removing and reducing waste in the construction oh, yeah, side. Yeah. Exactly. That's I think that's number Potentially, it might be number two. Okay. So um, it's it's di- waste diversion, mm-hmm. really, is what we're talking about. Material reuse and waste diversion. Rhonda and I just came up with these today, so right. I haven't burned them into my head yet. Got it. But um, material reuse and waste diversion. Material reuse is a subject matter that that you know I learned a lot about because of our relationship with Carnegie Mellon. Mm-hmm. We had a woman named Tanaz who is a PhD yeah. student at. Um, CMU, <laughs> she focuses a lot on material reuse. Mm-hmm. She's really into digital twins. Okay. And her uh, advisor, um, Dr. Lee, um, uh, it's a it's a it's a conversation that they're having quite a bit of, and we think it's really important to be talking mm. about again at the very beginning. Right. How are architects going to reuse this material? How are we thinking about waste diversion, and where are these materials going to go? And it's important from a circularity standpoint too, right? Because exactly. you can start to find other uses. I mean, in the civil world, like there's always use for recycled steel or turning concrete into aggregate. And sometimes, like I've found that we don't celebrate that enough. Um, it, it's kind of a foregone conclusion. Like, oh yeah, you know, we we pass it off to here or there. But it's so important in terms of reducing the carbon impact and finding new uses for materials. Yeah, I mean, I had a fascinating morning um, that I, this, things happened from a in the world of recycling that I didn't even realize gonna, was going to happen when I woke up. But I started <laughs> exchanging emails with some of the t- uh, the members of the committee of the MBA Green Builders Committee mm-hmm. and. Um, I got an introduction um, to Will Hancock. Uh, he's with Michael Brothers. Mm-hmm. He is helping to kind of redefine how they're recycling things. And one of the big question marks that we've that I, I was tasked with on this committee was how how are we recycling or how can we start to recycle um, drywall? Mm. There is a place in Pennsylvania. It's four hours away. Yeah, you oh, know? like so, EPA. Uh, Somewhere yes. out there, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, so Michael Brothers is starting to do this now, and I went and visited their facility, which is oh, up nice. in Troy Hill. It okay. was really cool Next to, to see. Next to Scratch and Company. What's that? Next to Scratch and Company. A little farther away. Uh, okay. It's much, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but they're doing some really interesting things, and I think that, like you said before, you know, or what we were saying before, is that the conversation wasn't there, and now it's there. Yeah. I mean, do you see that, I mean, you talk about the museums and Carnegie Mellon, are owners really starting to approach that in, in terms of like asking the question of builders, like, what are you doing with stuff? Really? Yeah, yeah, actually, um, in conjunction with Workscape, uh, they 
um, are the, do you know Workscape? I'm not familiar. No. They're the distributors of Miller, Miller Knoll Furniture, but they're oh, also yeah, the distributors yeah, okay. of a product called Dirt. Yes. Which stands doing for- Doing it right do the it right, first time. Doing, do it right this time. This time, okay. Um, and it's a, um, they actually do prefabricated, you know, structures. Mm -hmm. And we, as a team, Workscape, Dirt, and Volpac Construction, um, have been going to owners to have a conversation about are you thinking about sustainability? Mm -hmm. What are you thinking about when it comes to prefabrication, mm -hmm. right? Um, and how can we start having that conversation up front? Yep. You know, dirt's a fascinating product. You can, you can build a dirt wall and then move it around in places. And that's great yep. for something like the Warhol Museum or the Carnegie Museum because they can build an exhibit and, and instead of tearing that down and throwing it away, they it's can move reusable. it. Wow. And apparently you can lease it. So it's a cost over time as opposed to being this big chunk of money that you spend up front. So it's a service as a service model? Um, like, like like you can lease the dirt. You can lease to own, basically. Okay. Right? Okay. Oh, that's fascinating. What are some of the other things that you guys have on the horizon from the event standpoint that uh, I'm, I'm going to test you here? <laughs> like, um, what? let me ask this. Like, what are some of the visions? Like, these are great conversations to have. What do we hope comes out of them? You know, one of the things that I really want to see come out of it, and I want to see this kind of, I want Pittsburgh to be seen as a region that's setting the standard for circularity in construction, mm. right? And thinking, being experts at, uh, the experts mm -hmm. at how we're thinking about this and how we're kind of changing the way we build. Interesting. You know, it, it, it just uh, a little bit of an, uh, not an aside, but a thought to connect. Um, there's some really great work that's happening, uh, and usually I don't uh, promo other cities, but I'm going to do this, in Charlotte. Um, Envision Charlotte, which is a kind of their version of, of like a sustainable Pittsburgh. And so they are having a circularity conference coming up uh, in early March. And I'll get you connected to that. Oh, great. Um, one of the things that's really fascinating that they've done, uh, they have a location there called The Barn, and it's a bunch of corporate partners and university folks and kind of community people. And it's just a uh, like a, a panacea of circularity. And they're working with a really fabulous company called Metabolic, um, which we worked with when I was at the city of Pittsburgh, that does citywide uh, waste flow analysis. This huh. is like deep nerd stuff right here. But effectively, you understand like all of the materials that flow through your city. And as a, you know, so like the inputs on one side and then the outputs on the other. And so then the idea with that is that you're able to start to manage and identify new markets for those materials so that they don't end up in landfill. So just exactly what you're talking about, the building scale, Metabolic is looking at this at a citywide scale. And it's a huge economic development driver in terms of new industries and technologies and materials, manufacturing. I mean, it's a it's a fascinating process. Well, then this is this is maybe deep nerd stuff as well. Most of our listeners are deep nerds. So we're um, cool. This is a good space. So uh, there was something interesting when I went to We the... say that affectionately to those <laughs> listeners. <laughs> you know, the city of Pittsburgh is starting to test that composting program. Uh -huh. You know about that, right? Yep, yep. that's my um, colleague, former colleague, Afton Giles. Quick and shout so out. my big question on that is, you know, is there a methane capture opportunity there, right? And then what do we do with that? Oh, Oh boy! Yeah, the answer. is- Am I the interviewer now? No, nah, well, no. Nah, <laughs> there is. We can switch seats. It works. No, there's. There is. Um, and so, there is. I would say kind of a a debate of sorts in terms of uh, ultimate use. And so that methane capture, we thought about it in a couple different ways. What Afton's looking at is kind of like a uh, in the city currently in this program is the the residential impact. So, like, what can you do with, like, backyard composting and help to reduce, ultimately, the organic waste that you put in the trash, mm -hmm. right? The other school of thought is is there's uh, methane capture currently at the a lot of landfills right now where they turn that methane into CNG mostly for a lot of their trucks. So, like, uh, waste management, um, some of the other local waste haulers will, will, will do that. Um, and then the, the other is... Uh, at a big macro scale, you have like waste collection treatment places like Alcasan, 
And so like, what can you do with wastewater treatment? So there's multiple scales of how that all materializes. It was fascinating. I, you've, I'm glad I still remember a lot of that stuff. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, just to kind of, you know, wrap up a little bit, what are some of the things um, you have these events coming up, but, you know, from an industry standpoint, I'm always interested to see what people are thinking about, like what's around the corner for you? Like, is there a, a new technology or is there a, a, a new kind of innovation opportunity that, you know, you see on the near term horizon that, that you got your finger on the pulse on? You know, I, I'm going to say that it's it's the digital twin technology. Mm -hmm. I, and I, um, <clears throat> I'm biased a little bit, sure, of course. But, you know, it's in such nascent stages. We're testing it on uh we're the beta testers for a project, um, and then Canon Design mm -hmm. um, is going to test it on one of their projects as well. Um, we're going to learn a lot as beta mm -hmm. testers, and I think that you know the platform will likely change a bit. Um, John um, Burton, the CEO, is speaking at the NVIDIA conference called GTC wow. on March 19th. Um, so that's that's exciting. That's in San Jose. Um, so. We're going to have a lot of case studies. Mm -hmm. We'll have the case study around the Veterans Building. We'll have a case study around um, the project at Carnegie Mellon and how we're doing waste diversion there. Mm -hmm. um, we're really going to look to find unique ways uh, to manage a building, unique yeah. ways to, um, to divert waste away from the landfill. And we're going to have stories to tell. Yeah. That's exciting. So people will be able to learn from those and hopefully take those learnings into their own businesses. That's awesome. Well, once you have those case studies, you need to come back to the Green Voice and we can talk about them. I'd love it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael, for being a, a guest here on the Green Voice podcast. Um, thank you to the team at Pittsburgh Earth Day and the team here at the Center for Media Innovation at Point Park University. I'm your host, Grant Irvin, from SMB USA Construction here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Thanks for listening in, and we will check you out at the next time on The Green Voice. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.